Okay, so the, this is the second sub-theme um, for theme four. Um, popular culture and social change. So popular culture and entertainment. I said social change though, because um, actually this um, something I think if you're simply using um, the revision resources you have in, in terms of if you've got a revision guide or either, either of the two textbooks, I actually think the focus of this topic um, can be a little bit tricky. I think it's actually one of the more interesting topics um, and one of, the, one of the more, I would say straightforward, but I think it's one of the more accessible topics. However, I think the way that it's structured and organised in each of the textbooks um, can sometimes leave it a bit unclear as to what the focus of this topic is. I think it can potentially come up in a few different areas, but um, the way it's kind of organised in the books uh, is it sort of takes the four components, which I'll come back to in a second, of this topic, which is basically cinema, music, radio and TV, and it kind of just does a sort of narrative description for, to a large extent of what's happening in those different fields um, or well, what changes in those areas for the kind of 60, 60 or 70 year period. Um, what I actually find though is the main focus of this theme, um, or this sub theme, and how I'm going to organise it, um, is really the relation that popular culture has to social change. Um, it could possibly come up in other areas, but I find that is actually the main focus. Um, it's essentially um, the extent to which popular culture and entertainment shapes social change and society, or um, whether it's in fact um, a reflection of society itself. So, um, is popular culture leading to social change, or actually is popular culture simply a reflection of what's going on in society in the first place, or in fact is it actually obscuring social change or preventing it? Um, there is also, at the end of this topic, this additional question of how far youth culture um, developed as a result of social change and popular culture. I'm not really going to go into that um, topic in great detail um, in this lecture, so that's one of the areas which you'd need to kind of supplement a lot more uh, on your own uh, by checking out the relevant sections. Um, the final point on that as well is, unlike the other, so, so when it comes to cinema, music, radio and television, um, unlike the latter three, cinema is the only one of these four that actually has a significant amount of content or topics that cover the interwar period. Um, and when, when it comes to that, it relates really mainly to leisure time. Um, radio and music have some minor points here, um, but actually it's, it's mainly cinema. And this, this sort of interwar part isn't really so much to do with social change. The reason being is there isn't really much social change in the interwar period. Social change comes after the Second World War. So it's really more about um, how it links to leisure time. So the first few slides I'm going to go over, I would say that links in much more to the next topic, um, which is about leisure time. And a lot of the points I'm going to mention in the next slides are relevant to the next sub theme. Um, so we're going to start off with cinema as a result. Um, so cinema as an entertainment um, form, or media entertainment, grows significantly in the interwar period, and it really comes to an, comes into its own. In many ways, the golden age of cinema is in the interwar period. Um, so during the post-war slump of the 1920s, sorry, during the post-war economic slump of the 1920s, um, you start to get ticket sales um, rising or ticket sales increasing, and that goes up even further during the depression. Um, so some of the numbers are actually quite staggering given the population of the country in the 20s and 30s. So in the 1930s, you've got almost 20 million tickets being sold each week. So cinema is a genuinely widespread form of entertainment and leisure that people are actively involved in um, in the interval period. So it's definitely one of the most common for, one of the most common ways that people are spending their leisure time in the interval period. Um, And in particular, what's really interesting, if you look at the growth of cinema in the interwar period, um, it's striking just how much of a working class activity it is, or just how accessible um, it is to kind of go to the movies um, for sort of the cinema and then employment. It plays quite a significant role um, in their lives. So you get hundreds of what they refer to as picture palaces being built in this period, um, which are kind of more respectable places that do attract the middle class um, attendees. However, they do arguably play a more significant role in the life of the unemployed and the working classes. Um, so again, there's some really interesting numbers and stats that I think are quite telling when it comes to the story of um, sort of leisure time or the story of unemployed in the 30s. So in 1931, there's a London study carried out which shows that the unemployed, on average, attend cinema 2.6 times a week or close to three times a week. Um, 
That's in particular during the daytime um, when tickets are basically cheap and obviously if they're unemployed, they have, to, they have the time to go there. Um, there's also a stat which says that in Glasgow, which again, if you've done your um, theme one year revision recently, uh, Glasgow is one of these areas of the country as a kind of um, a location where you've got a lot of shipbuilding, where there's quite a high number of unemployed people. Um, of the unemployed in Glasgow in the 30s, 80% of them go to the cinema once a week. So it's quite a uh, cinema. Um, is quite an important um, outlet, but it's quite an important leisure activity for the unemployed. Uh, and in many ways, it's kind of one of the few forms of escapism um, that is available to them from the realities of their life. These are people who have got quite difficult lives, um, who have sort of seen their lives crumble around them over the, sort of the early part of the decade. Uh, and as an activity, it was cheap enough for most people to afford. Um, and that cost probably accounts for why it's more popular in the north than it was in the south. It really was this, one of the main um, aspects of leisure that were available um, to most working class people. Um, and so as I say, within, within, when, when you look at the next sub-theme, which you can, you can often get questions about um, widespread availability of leisure or what kind of is the most significant for leisure activity, um, cinema is definitely an important, um, an important point you can bring up or discuss since it was quite significant. Um, what does happen uh, is that cinema goes into decline after the Second World War. Um, this, is an, this is kind of a point that I've seen mentioned in both in the revision guide and both textbooks that I'm not sure kind of how it fits into um, different topics. I suppose it could fit into changing leisure interests or activities. Uh, cinema isn't what it was in the post-war period, what it was in the interwar period. So it kind of goes into decline, in particular with the advent of television, which becomes more widespread after the Second World War. Uh, and that's despite the fact that there are um, a large number of quite highly regarded British films being produced. British cinema, as I'm going to go into in a moment, does come into its own um, in the post-war period. However, despite that, inter uh, sorry, attendances, um, attendances to, to movies does fall quite significantly. So um, between 47 and 59, attendances drop from about 1.4 million to about 800,000. Um, I think that number is per week, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, Additionally, you also, um, although so when, when it comes to that highly regarded British cinema, it tends to be, again, as I'm going to come back to in a moment, uh, in this sort of budget comedy category, um, they're sort of high budget, um, high production, sort of high budget, um, big production British films, does again kind of tend to kind of go into decline after the Second World War. Outside of a couple of franchises like James Bond, you get very, very few successful blockbuster British films. So the British cinema industry itself, does from a commercial standpoint, go into decline as well to an extent. Um, I've seen, I should come back to that point in a second, um, what, as, what kind of reason behind that is that most uh, British talent tend to have gone to television, which was basically becoming quite a big uh, medium after the Second World War, um, all moved to the US because funding cuts by the government, um, funding of sort of cinema um, shrunk um, as a result. I've seen questions, and it's worth putting at this point, I've seen questions in the revision guide that's been published that is specifically about why cinema goes into decline. Um, obviously, I can't give 100% guarantees, but I feel like that is a really unlikely topic. I've not really seen much on that topic in any of the materials that have been produced by different um, publishing companies. Um, so if that did come up, I would say you were super unlucky to just sort of swerve that topic unless you know somehow quite a lot about it. Um, I think that's a very unlikely focus. Um, I think what's, what could be potentially more um, plausible is if they ask the question about changing leisure interests over time. Um, that would be its own independent point. Um, the big thing though is the importance of cinema after the Second World War when it comes to this debate over social change. Um, and so there's an argument that actually cinema does in the post-war period reflect quite important social issues and in particular British cinema is really um, engaged with or concerned with a lot of the social issues that come out of the Second World War. Um, this is particularly the case with the popular Ealing or the popular comedies that are produced by the Ealing um, film studios uh, after the Second World War. Um, these in particular often tend to explore in quite interesting ways the changing quality of life after the war um, and so they usually reflect, and particularly in the years after the war, uh, a lot of public satisfaction with the state of policies like um, post-war rationing, etc. So there's, in this instance, a particularly famous film, um, Passport to Pimlico, um, which essentially is a satire of the harsh post-war economic conditions. Um, 
essentially people look up, think finds they've got oil or something or gold like underneath the well, underneath underneath the area. They declare independence from the country. They end up they kind of they end rationing and they end up becoming richer than Britain is. And so it's kind of a commentary on the situation with rationing after the Second World War. So it's a reflection of this popular satisfaction with the state of the of the, of the country and the government. This sort of reflection of social issues continues, um, or rather, reflection of people's kind of concerns or people's attitudes uh, towards social issues continues in the 70s. So you start to get uh, so that the feeling in the 50s is when it comes to healing comedies, um, kind of issues about rationing, etc. Um, in the 70s, again, given the public mood, you start to get films that are produced that have a much more dark. Um, Kind of vision of where the country is basically, um, or how the country is kind of turned out or, or transformed, uh, and that's representative of the changing times and fears among the public, whether true or not, probably untrue. That in the 70s, the country had basically started to experience rising crime rates. Society was becoming increasingly much more permissive. That was a particular concern that a lot of people had. Whether that was true or not, um, films that produced in this time period are very much a reflection of again these changing attitudes and also changing fears and concerns of the public population at the time. So again, a couple of really famous films. Uh, there's Michael Caine's Get Carter film, which has quite explicit scenes, uh, sort of gangster film, quite explicit scenes of drug abuse and prostitution. The most controversial film, of course, of the decade uh, is A Clockwork Orange, which offers this very full-on dystopian vision of Britain uh, with quite serious, um, and quite shocking scenes of violence. So you've got sort of gangs, so sort of violently and randomly beating people up, killing people on the streets, um, raping for enjoyment. It's got very gritty, uh, quite uncomfortable scenes, and so it's a very controversial film. Uh, but again, it seemed to represent what is I meaning. Again, if you've seen Clockwork Orange, it's clearly not an accurate representation of what's going on in the country. But it is seen to most certainly be a reflection of the concerns that many had or feared that there was a decline in the quality of life and there were these issues kind of ongoing, even if it wasn't actually reflected um, in actual physical events. So yeah, so there's ways in which um, cinema is sort of seen to reflect important social issues of the day or reflect a lot of the changes that are taking place, um, which suggests it's not necessarily causing social change, but simply reflecting and simply is acting as a mirror um, against changes in British society. An even further counter argument is that not, uh, it's not just the case that cinema is simply a reflection of society, oftentimes cinema is used to reinforce traditional ideas or traditional values and beliefs in society. Um, this is particularly the case, um, and this is the last one I mentioned about cinema, this is particularly the case um, when it comes to a lot of these. Um, War films that are produced, that are produced in the 50s and 60s, you get this large number of actually quite good um, war films produced that very much reinforce traditional ideas and values, primarily through this very positive portrayal of Britain during the war, kind of very patriotic, um, a very patriotic uh, portrayal. Um, so this is particularly important given what's happening in the 50s and 60s. The, after the Second World War, Britain's empire begins to disintegrate quite rapidly. And then by the late 50s, early 60s, that's when you get this, this very quick succession of African uh, countries in particular, all gaining independence within the space of about three or four years. Um, and so combining this kind of decline of the empire along with the relative economic decline of Britain, when I say relative, we mean, because at that point you might think, hang on a minute, isn't Britain doing well in the 50s? Britain is relative to other countries falling back in the world. So Britain's position in the world, given the kind of empire, and the increasing importance of other economies, um, it's kind of beginning to create uncertainties among the public and kind of where Britain's place is in the world. Um, and so these war films often help to reinforce a sense of patriotism or promote rather a sense of declining or promote patriotism at a time when it could arguably be in decline given international events um, that are taking place. Um, and so again, what you, typically, what you typically get with these films is they tend to be um, films that are based on some kind of successful British operation, or some kind of successful historical operation by the British Army during the, war, the Second World War, that is, I mean. Uh, so again, a couple of really famous films here. There's The Dam Busters, which is based on this um, famous um, RAF attack on these German dams. Um, Sink the Bismarck is also particularly um, 
popular and important film. Uh, it gets praised by critics, um, particularly for kind of, well, it's praised for, its, for the portrayal of the range of individuals that are kind of involved in planning the attack on the Bismarck. Um, as I say, what's interesting is they do actually tend, these aren't just sort of propaganda films, they're actually quite good um, as spectacles. Um, and there are several others as well that are considered to be quite um, powerful films. But again, they, they sort of arguably play this role in reinforcing uh, traditional social ideas and values with regards to patriotism. Um, so I think on the whole, you could argue, and again, if, if, you, had, if you had an essay about uh, popular culture and social change, if you divided things by entertainment mode, which that is a possible structure, I think it would be best to argue that cinema isn't really um, a cause of social change. It rather often reflects changes, or in fact, often used to reinforce changes. But again, you, you, it's up to you how you do that, and that's the best bet in this instance. Um, the second form of entertainment, um, or popular culture, um, that comes out, and this, this, this is the shortest of each of the um, entertainment methods um, or mediums that are mentioned, um, or on the specification, is radio. Um, so radio, again, like cinema, is something which emerges in the interwar period. Um, so between 1922 and 1939, radio is kind of go from having a of 1% to 71%. So radio very much becomes part of the lives of most people in the country. By 1951, you've got 90% of the country um, owning radios or having access to a radio. Um, and so this, as a kind of... Uh, a medium entertainment is used quite a lot during the Second World War, as you may be aware, um, to help boost morale, particularly in factories. So you kind of get radio set up everywhere to kind of promote all kinds of messages or sort of news broadcasts, etc. Um, what's interesting is, again, when you look at how radio develops, um, the government initially, when radio um, is introduced, are actually quite worried about the potential influence of radio and are originally quite um, unsupportive. The reason being is this is kind of one of the first forms of entertainment or medium entertainment that is actually quite difficult to regulate and control. Um, it's not like, for example, publishing a newspaper, which is a kind of physical um, item which you can to a degree regulate. Um, anybody could, could effectively kind of set up radio stations potentially and promote whatever kind of ideas they want to. It's quite difficult to stop people from promoting an idea to quite large numbers. Um, so it's quite a uh, revolutionary um, technology. Um, they do eventually, though, later um, become more supportive, and so they formed the BBC, which was the British Broadcast Corporation, which is originally a radio station, um, and they give them the sole license to broadcast. So up until, as I'm going to come back to in a moment, um, the 50s and 60s, um, the BBC is the only legal and licensed radio station, or um, yeah, radio station in the country. Basically, anything, anything else is a pirate. Um, so by the end of the Second World War, got about 11 million daily listeners um, to BBC broadcasts. In the 50s and 60s, you begin to start to see the emergence of pirate radio stations. Um, these pirate radio stations, these pirate radio stations are more popular as they basically are able to appeal to teenagers increasingly who've got more modern, I'm uh, sorry, and basically play more modern pop music. Um, the BBC eventually is kind of forced to follow suit and give in because they're uh, losing quite a lot of listeners in that demographic, again to, to these pirate radio stations, and they follow suit and begin to, they introduce their own um, channels um, that begin to play different forms of music as well to cater to that. In 75, so towards the end of this period, so a bit too late for our um, sort of likely to make much of a difference for this um, particular course, uh, BBC loses monopoly on legal radio stations and the government begins to license other stations, um, yeah, begins to license other radio stations. So bringing it back to the um, overall focus I'll keep this on, which is um, social change and the extent to which uh, popular culture creates social change. Again, radio is another medium where it's quite easy to argue that actually popular culture or entertainment is used to actually reinforce traditional ideas, in particular given that, as I already mentioned, radio initially starts off as being essentially state-run, because that's the BBC. Um, there are no other legally licensed radio stations. Um, and so the government uses, according to some historians who argue this, they use the BBC to promote their values, um, and it's referred to by these um, two guys, um, David Cardiff and Paddy Scannell, 
that the BBC basically functions as an instrument of social control, and that's what the government used it for essentially. Um, and so if you look at the programming that they mainly came, came up with, um, they would often air programs that were designed to reinforce, again, much like those films we discussed, um, a sense of national unity um, and a sense of belonging. So if you look at the range of programs you'd get, you'd get things like anniversary programs for Empire Day, um, which has obvious um, kind of social purposes. Uh, you also start to get the annual broadcasting to the nation of the monarch's Christmas message. Um, and so the so in the early period, in particular still in the kind of 40s, 50s, even into early 60s to a degree, um, radio basically reflects the values of the government rather than the preferences and values of the listeners in this early period. Um, so this is the first thing. You can, however, on a flip side, argue, um, so a bit more balanced on the radio, on the radio side, um, that it does actually, in the end, um, become a reflection, once again, of society. Um, so, there is an argument that the um, BBC does not actually influence social change, um, as they're simply reacting to um, other popular radio stations that are kind of cropping up these illegal pirate radios we've already mentioned. Um, so in the 50s and 60s, people do increasingly begin to tune into um, illegal, illegal radio stations. So for example, uh, Radio Caroline um, has about 10 million listeners um, broadcasting off their ship somewhere in, well, I don't know where they're broadcasting actually, um, somewhere. Um, and again, they start to play this sort of more modern pop music instead of the programs that the BBC are airing, um, which are less interesting to younger people. And so what you get is, um, the BBC, as I've already mentioned, to kind of avoid losing this demographic, uh, establishing new radio stations like Radio 1 and 67, which begin to um, play pop music to maintain listeners. So again, I think it's uh, difficult to argue that radio influences social change. Um, and in fact, as the medium itself changes over time, it's because it's a reflection of what has happened in society. Um, so again, it kind of ends up being that argument that it's rather a mirror um, of changes that, that have taken place already um, within the country or across the country. So that's it with radio, which as I say, it's probably the shortest and smallest um, of all the um, four B topics. The second, the, the third topic, which I'd say is the second big um, topic for this, is music. And music, like cinema, uh, does have a bit of bit of content when it comes to interwar, when it comes to the interwar period, a lot of which I would say is quite relevant to the next sub-theme for C when it comes to leisure activities. Um, because like cinema, um, a lot of the changes that take place with music in the interwar period um, are also quite relevant when it comes to um, people's sort of general leisure activities across the country. Um, so in, in the interwar period you start to get a lot of these new waves of American music arriving in the UK. Um, that are quite influential on popular music. So things like ragtime and jazz um, in the 20s, swing and bop start to arrive around about the late 30s. Um, so what you get, much like the big picture palaces when it comes to cinema, you also start to get um, these popular dance halls cropping up all over the country um, that become quite popular, um, in particular when these American dancers start to arrive. So sort of things like you know, Foxtrot, Charleston, etc. You in particular get a range of quite luxurious dance halls um, that are sort of created. Um, a lot of these are called palais. So, for example, one of those famous ones is the Hammersmith Palais, uh, which is built in this period. Um, and again, much like cinema, what's really interesting is, and again, this is why I think it's quite a, a relevant point to mention um, for the 4C topic, and also actually potentially when you discuss quality of life, this is also I think a relevant point that could be brought up. Um, these activities are readily available to young working class men and women. Um, it's not something which is exclusive to um, um, other groups. So when we look at 4C um, leisure, a lot of the stuff when it comes to holidays, etc., tend to be quite exclusive. These other forms of entertainment tend to be readily available. Um, and so you've got about, oh, well, as, as, a, as a piece of evidence that supports this point, you've got about 20,000 dance bands approximately um, going around the place in the 1930s performing, performing at different venues. So I think the, the fact that you've got a um, system uh, or activity which can sustain that many dance acts suggests there are enough people who are actually attending these venues in the first place to require you to have that many. 
Um, so that's a significant number when you really consider it. So again, it's a very pop form of attainment, um, and I think on that 4C topic, you could definitely combine it with the point about cinema um, when it comes to leisure activities that are available. Um, when it comes to the post-war period, there's obviously a lot more you can discuss when it comes to this issue of social change. Um, and actually, what's quite interesting is, um, I would say music has a much more balanced discussion when it comes to whether or not it um, does create social change or a simple reflection or, yeah. Um, so with music, the key thing is here, um, it's quite a complex story when it comes to social change and ultimately it boils down to whatever music genre you are speaking about or talking about. So different genres reflect different changes. Um, so if we're talking about rock and roll music, Rock and roll tends to be a reflection of society, I think you could argue, um, much like I mentioned with the points about cinema and um, radio. Essentially, the 50s really does mirror this desire in society to kind of move away from this sort of quite depressing and dull 40s era with rationing, etc. Uh, people are increasingly with this kind of consumer society um, beginning to demand music that kind of matches that outlook, which is quite cheery, and also sort of rather, which is quite cheerful. Um, so you get, for example, performers uh, in the fifties and sixties, American rock performers like Elvis Presley, um, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, um, who make various forms of um, sort of black blues music quite popular among the youth uh, in the form of rock. Um, you would start to then get um, sort of British bands that kind of emulate that um, same style of rock and roll um, and sort of overtake those American acts. The most famous, of course. Uh, being the Beatles. And again, the Beatles' success in so many ways is a reflection of what people at the time were demanding. People wanted this really optimistic, cheerful tone. And um, in many ways, that is why the Beatles took off so much. They were basically delivering exactly what people's attitudes um, sort of were demanding at the time. Um, and so this is, as I say, in the context of these, ri these rising living standards, this consumer society, which I mentioned in, um, the, in the previous lecture, um, the 4A1, um, this kind, of, this kind of increasingly consumer society, this music captures those times a lot more accurately. Um, so rock and roll music, I think, is definitely a reflection of the society at the time. Um, a similar point, I think, could also a similar point, I think, could also be made about modern music. Um, I'm not going to lie, I know very, very little about. Um, but uh, one thing I do know um, is that as a musical form, it does tend to end up being quite heavily associated with associated with consumerism um, and a lot of the looks that go with sort of, well, this sort of the mod look and the clothes that the artists wear, etc. Uh, it's again quite heavily influenced by the culture and society of the time. Um, and particularly with this, with this kind of, well, in particular the fact that a lot of young people in particular start to purchase um, the sort of particular accessories that these different bands are wearing, etc. Uh, so again, I think the popularity of mod music is a reflection of sort of the consumerist society of the day. I'm not going to go keep on that point for too long because I'm not really that knowledgeable sure about it. Um, you then get musical um, genres that you could argue actually challenge um, traditional social ideas and norms. So if you make an argument that music um, does kind of lead to social change or does help contribute to social change, one of the first forms you can talk about, I think, is glam rock. Um, which by the 70s um, starts to become quite popular. Um, and glam rock is kind of this genre of music um, by which you increasingly get artists beginning to challenge a lot of quite traditional social norms, in particular um, when it comes to things like gender identity um, and attitudes towards homosexuality. Um, the obvious example here is obviously David Bowie, who's the leading glam rock performer of the age, um, in particular when it comes to this. Um, one of these early um, androgynous and um, alter egos, he adopts this um, Ziggy Stardust persona, um, where essentially, yeah, is it's basically sort of a um, an androgynous camp alter ego, um, and so performers like him increasingly begin to challenge traditional views on heterosexuality, social norms. It's quite fascinating to a lot of young people at the time um, who are becoming increasingly rebellious and subversive. And so you could argue that actually. This is uh, the way in which those values are challenged. Um, you can also kind of attribute um, the sort of popularity of these artists to the fact that you do get this increasingly affluent young um, demographic who have more money um, 
and therefore have more ways to potentially challenge social norms um, in a way that previous generations couldn't really so you've kind of got a more assertive um, sort of young generations are able to do that. Um, they're able to sort of like assert their identity in a way in which previous generations couldn't, which is enabled by their wealth that allows them, enables them to make different lifestyle choices um, because there's such, well, because they're somewhat more independent as a result of their um, increasing wealth. Um, and then the second genre, or final genre, I think, which you could argue um, is quite explicit in creating social change or in trying to use music as a way to create social change is finally roots reggae. Um, and so reggae starts to become one of the most popular music genres in Britain in the 70s. Um, and it's a musical form that's in particular obviously used and developed by um, this kind of oppressed black minority who use the genre quite often to share their experiences of various elements of racism in the country when it comes to police brutality, um, police violence, general hardship um, whilst they're sort of living in Britain. Um, and so what I think is quite interesting about Roots Reggae is, well, Re Reggae in particular also Roots Reggae, is it's actually explicitly and directly used um, as a method by civil rights activists to try and promote their support of kind of a different kind of vision of Britain, a more multicultural tolerant Britain. Um, so unlike other genres where you can say it's more implicit, uh, there is definitely a direct link between this genre and activism and attempts to create social change. So if we take one of these um, Demis Roots Reggae artists, this guy Linton, um, Crazy Johnson, so he famously releases this song, um, All We're Doing Is Defending, um, which is basically again about sort of black anger, about things like the National Front have become quite popular and active at this time, um, common complaints about police brutality. Um, if we take him as an example, um, it's not a stretch to say he's pushing for social change because he's actually involved in organisations that are actively calling for social change. So again, if, you, if you've looked at the free seat topic recently, um, his name might ring a bell. He's a former member of the Black Panthers Youth League, um, and when he's young, uh, well, sorry, when he was younger, and later on, he's a member of the Race Today Collective, which is again one of these black radical groups that crops up in the early 70s in Britain. Um, additionally, uh, he often, um, and these groups often collaborate with various liberal magazines like Time Out, Oz. Um, to actually, again, explicitly try and influence youth opinion and expose racism in the country. Um, so Roots Reggae is definitely quite explicit in its message of trying to challenge, um, very, sorry, trying to create social change, and many of the artists also have links to these movements as well. Um, so it's not a stretch. What you could do as a counter-argument, and it's quite similar to the next point, is you could argue that actually the popularity or extent or importance of these genres is overstated and therefore even though it is clearly uh, an attempt to create social change you could question the extent to which roots reggae is uh, particularly um, influential or significant as a genre and that same point can actually um, transfer to this final point um, about punk so again you can once again make the argument that some music genres um, are a reflection of um, again, changes that are taking place, and punk is again one of these uh, musical genres. Um, punk is a reflection of the fact that in the 70s, you get a relative decline in living standards with things like higher inflation, unemployment among youth in particular starting to, to, to rise again for the first time after the Second World War. Um, and so, um, so this punk music is often referred to as being the music of the doll with you, aka the unemployed youth. Um, and it's, that's who's particularly popular among these sort of increasingly large masses of unemployed people um, and it's a method of, or a, a musical genre that basically articulates their anger at the lack of opportunities they're basically facing and the kind of living standards that's taking place in the 70s. Um, but as I said, like the Bruce Reggae genre, you can question the extent to which punk music um, represents the country as a whole um, and it doesn't really create social change as, 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 an, um, uh, as a result. Um, it doesn't really, even though it seems to be culturally significant, it doesn't actually end up being that popular in Britain. Um, you, when you think of the 70s really, the, the, mo the genres you, you consider the most are again the more optimistic music of disco artists that start to become popular like the Bee Gees, like Elton John, Queen again coming to their own. So we talk about punk music but actually it's questionable how far it's a popular and significant musical genre outside of a um, sort of cult following or cultural significance. Um, so again, 
on the whole, that's quite a questionable point. Um, but with music, I think ultimately what you want to, um, the way you kind of push the argument when it comes to social change um, is essentially up to you. I think there are definitely ways you can argue it either. Uh, you can argue it either way. Um, you can uh, you can argue it in a few different methods or a few different ways, um, or divide it by genre. Um, I would also say as a point of warning as well. Um, if you had, and this is something which often extends to a lot of topics, if you did get a question that was broadly about social change, because there are so many types of musical genres, one of the temptations you can often get is um, writing an entire essay about music, because you could really, if you knew your stuff, do like a paragraph about each particular genre. And at that point, you basically restricted the question a little bit too much by just focusing on that. So I think that's something else to kind of avoid falling um, down that sort of, or falling into that trap. And particularly if you're quite keen on this, and I know a lot of people are quite keen on it, you can, I think, get tempted to do that a bit too much. I was just going to watch out for that. Um, okay, the final um, medium then, uh, which I find perhaps the most interesting, um, and I think you again could argue does create social change uh, with some really explicit interesting examples, is television. Um, and there are a few different ways this can be argued. In fact, I would say your, your most secure footing for arguing that social change is created by popular culture is TV. And there are several different angles you can approach this from. The first way is that it creates social change by virtue of its popularity. Forgetting what, ignoring what's actually on, the t on TV itself, TV itself, by popularity, creates social change. Um, People, and again, this could either link to the social change question, or if you had a question about leisure time, this also links into that question. People, um, TV begins to increasingly monopolise and dominate an increasingly large share of people's leisure time um, in the post-war period. As prices start to go down, so do the number of people who own TV sets. And so again, the numbers that show this, um, between 47 and 1960, the number of people who have TV licenses goes from 15,000 to 10 million, um, which is a huge increase, um, which is the 13 year gap. So TV begins to dominate um, sort of, uh, family life across the country. Um, it is argued, usually by critics of TV, that it radically alters family life, in particular the traditional working class. Um, so, as you can presumably guess as well, um, sort of common social activities or um, parts of the day begin to increasingly be um, dominated by TV. So just things like meal time, general communication, that seem to have suffered or um, reduced uh, due to the prominence of TV sets in people's lives. So again, some of the numbers here are really staggering, um, especially if you're a millennial and growing up in the sort of post-TV world. Uh, you've got people watching on average about 16 to 20 hours of TV a week by the late 70s. That's a huge amount of your sort of leisure time to be taken up by that. Um, and so it does, as a result, become one of the most popular leisure activities or pursuits across all social groups. Um, again, that's an area where this can potentially um, extend to other something or other questions. Um, it's very much an activity or a leisure activity that is free from or free of class divisions, um, in particular in comparison to um, the way that, for example, outdoor leisure pursuits were linked to class divisions. Um, for example, dog racing for working class people versus tennis for the middle class. It's a much more egalitarian uh, form of entertainment than other um, forms of, well, other forms of leisure um, in the 20th century. So, what we can argue quite strongly um, is that TV plays a significant role in accelerating the decline of deference or the decline in deference that takes place after the Second World War. Um, so obviously, if you've revised the topic recently, you know that deference does start to go into decline for a range of different reasons, um, arguably because of the Second World War. Um, and the TV helps to accelerate that decline. Um, BBC bosses in particular, who've now gone into um, television broadcasting as well, uh, recognise this and begin to eliminate the elitist tones of a lot of programmes and begin to become more egalitarian. And so as a result, you start to see an increasing number of TV shows that challenge the traditional class structure and ridicule authority figures, which is something which is highly unlikely and quite rare and new in this time period where, again, there is this, um, there is this deference whereby people have a natural respect and awe um, for the authority um, of sort of the upper class or the, or the traditional ruling elites. Um, the best known example 
um, is the highly popular show which they see create. Um, that was the week, that was, I think they used to shorthand it to T, um, TW3, um, where essentially it's your first kind of pioneering political um, sort of talk show slash chat show where you begin to combine news with slightly more satirical humour when it comes to the interviews. Um, the interviews of leading politicians themselves um, starts to adopt a more rigorous tone as opposed to kind of um, adopting a more soft approach. They are kind of rigorously interrogating the question on their policies. Um, and then you also start to get a range of parodies that are kind of carried out. I mean, I, I, sort, of, I, thought, I sort of think about it as being this kind of 50s version of um, Sunday Night Live in America. Um, I imagine that's kind of what it ends up looking like. Um, and so, yeah, they kind of do quite a lot of these parodies that mock authority figures. This is something which has not been done before um, and helps to, as a result, accelerate this kind of deference, um, seeing as it's no longer being kind of held up by mass media. Um, so, there's a point about deference. The second thing that can be argued then is that it helps to shape public opinion about some important social issues. And again, I think this is a point which you could, you, you might initially feel as a bit of a stretch, but actually some of the um, time frames here are, you could argue it's a coincidence, you could argue actually there's quite a clear correlation strongly between them. Um, so as we know, the 1960s is where we start to see um, a range of important changes in government legislation on social issues. For example, legalizing abortion, decriminalizing homosexuality, etc., and a range of other kind of um, changes that are made. A lot of these important changes often coincide with some significant BBC dramas. Um, the best example of this, and again, I just think it's hard to argue it's a coincidence, I think it must have some kind of role, um, is 1965. Um, Ken Loach releases the film. Um, this film obviously is, kind of is, um, is brought to show on TV only. Um, he releases the film Up the Junction, um, which deals with quite a lot of different social issues. But what it's most well known for now is it features this really powerful scene of a woman um, who has a backstreet abortion. And again, it's, it's a very, it's very, it very explicitly calls for social change because if you actually watch the scene yourself, I'm pretty sure you can find it. Um, they get a real doctor, who's actually a real professional, uh, doing a voiceover during the scene, it's a really uncomfortable scene I have to say, um, doing a voiceover about the number of deaths that are caused each year by the number of backstreet abortions and therefore why there is a requirement for, 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 for reform. Um, this is, I think, um, so yeah, this is fairly close to the time when you get to the um, first book, well, the, the abortion act passed, which, um, which legalizes abortions. Um, secondly, again, by Ken Loach, about a year later, um, there's another coincidence where um, he produces a film called Kathy Come Home in 1966. Um, this film is basically about, um, it basically deals with a lot of issues related to homelessness, um, and it's produced, um, where it comes out, where it sort of aired two weeks before the charity Shelter is launched. Um, it gets watched by over 12 million people, um, and it's argued quite strongly that its impact helped um, lead, or helped ensure rather, uh, public empathy for and uh, support for shelter as a charity. Again, if you actually on the website themselves, they mention this point uh, and how it seemed to have sort of given them some momentum when the charity was first launched um, because it heightened public awareness of, of an interest in the issue of, um, of homelessness. So what we can argue here is that we're not saying these dramas are what created or caused that social change. What it definitely did do is uh, make quite a robust and strong contribution to the national debate and shape public, and shape public opinion in the national debate uh, about various social issues or in bringing some of those issues to the forefront of public opinion. So they don't actually cre they don't create social change directly or fully, but they certainly play an important role in the national debate, in particular when it comes to shifting public opinion. And then TV, you've definitely got some strong arguments about how they create social change or lead to social change and contribute in a couple of different ways. Um, however, there is, of course, a counter-argument that it, once again, doesn't create social change. It rather, um, well, well, it does one of two things. As again, either a reflection of society or helps to reinforce uh, traditional values. Um, so, we, we, give, we give these examples of quite significant programs that are shown, like the Ken Loach films, um, that challenge ideas like Kathy Come Home, like Kathy Come Home. However, what's telling is they're quite rare and they're quite few and far between. Um, these kind of shows are not really replicated quite widely, and instead, 
um, common sort of TV interests once again tend to appeal to uh, the same British appetite for kind of escape, for sort of escapers of classic comedies. Um, TV does tend to play it safe for the most part. Uh, again, various different shows that have very positive portrayals of traditional ideas. Um, so, the, the, so the Ken Loach dramas do end up being significant, but they're actually quite few and far between. There aren't really that many shows like them, so you could reduce their impact in that way. Um, the second thing is you once again get dramas that, as I say, reinforce traditional ideas. So, best example of this is there's this really popular police drama which, get, which gets released, I think, in the mid to late 70s, uh, called The Sweeney. Um, and it's basically this depiction of these really tough officers. Um, but at the same time, so they're, they're basically they're the protagonists. Um, but at the same time, to kind of achieve results, they often kind of bend the rules to get results and get arrests. So essentially, they're actually law-breaking police officers. Um, but at the same time, they're depicted as really honest men who simply want results. So it's a very positive portrayal of the police. So again, reinforcing these traditional values. Um, and so it, it seems to play quite an important role in um, reinforcing the beliefs of the population. But actually, the police are quite um, honest, decent people. So there's an argument, well, if you want to support that point, um, there's a poll in 77 which shows that three quarters of British people believe that the police were honest. And so again, you can't say it's entirely because of these shows, but it undoubtedly has an impact or must play some role in shaping um, sort of positive images or yeah, positive images of the police. Um, so I would say on the whole, it's probably best to argue TV does create social change, but again, you can make arguments say that it's um, kind of overstated or that in fact police does, I'm sorry, TV does on the whole, um, again, try to um, always use as a way of reinforcing traditional ideas. So those are not all the ways you can, you can sort of debate the points from this topic. If you then, so just, just to wrap up, if you were given um, a question discussing social change or reasons for social change. You can always discuss popular culture, even if the stated factor is from a different theme. So, for example, on last year's paper, the question was about social change, but the stated factor was, in fact, the economy. That you could still have discussed popular culture as an alternative argument. Similarly, if they state popular culture as the reason for social change, then you can still bring in other factors from different sub-themes as a cause of social change. So you have to always be aware that social change is a topic that is cross-theme. So you can, as always, continue to discuss the significance of economic influences, the growth of a consumer society, memories of austerity, um, kind of encouraging this more liberal society, etc. Um, you can always, of course, as is the case from theme, theme three, um, explain government policies and say, actually, social change is, is, is largely government-led and government-caused. Um, and they also kind of influence social mobility. So, for example, the introduction of comprehensive education, uh, the passing of various pieces of legislation by certain politicians who, who pushed quite heavily for it. Um, and the last thing I'd say is definitely a really good place or really good counter arguments worth, worth discussing and various different questions uh, is the influence of protest movements. Um, so again, you can argue that actually social change is largely influenced by social by protest movements. In particular, we're thinking here about the women's liberation movement, um, civil rights groups, um, sort of like black radical civil rights groups, etc., who kind of encourage people to challenge authority and shape legislation. So these are always interchangeable, well, it's interchangeable, um, or can be interlinked with a few of these different points from other sub themes. So it's always important to around that point as a kind of final thought. So I'll leave that to the end of that topic.